Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, GABA Receptive Microglia Selectively Sculpt Developing Inhibitory Circuits. I'm Alexis Krause of Leverts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labroots and sponsored by VizGen. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit their website at vizgen.com. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. And we'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speakers for today, Dr. Lloyd Benon, Klarman Cell Observatory, Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT, and Dr. Amelia Favuzzi, Harvard Medical School and Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. I will now turn it over to George Emanuel, VizGen co-founder and director, director of technology and partnerships to begin our presentation. Welcome, sir. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, and I'm excited to be here today to set the stage for our speakers. So this is VizGen's first talk in our series that provides a forum for some of our early adopters for VizGen's Smurfish platform to present the research they've been using this platform to enable. But as a scientist focused on developing new technologies, it's really most exciting to me to see that these technologies that we're developing are actually working to, to lead to real-world scientific discoveries that we'll hear about a little bit later today. But before we get too much into the science, I just want to give a brief introduction of VizGen. So just uh, briefly, I'll, I'll describe both what Murfish technology is uh, to set the stage for what you'll hear a little bit later. And also, I'll describe what VizGen is doing to help make Murfish technology more accessible through our Murfish solution. So at the broadest sense, we consider the next wave of spatial genomics technologies as really the next iteration of not just spatial technologies, but genomics technologies. With bulk sequencing, you, you're able to count the number of RNA transcripts within a, a large tissue block to understand which genes might be upregulated or downregulated in different uh, situations or different drug treatments and really understand more about which what each of these genes is doing. But there you lose two fundamental components of the biological system. You lose the single cell information because each individual cell is responding to its uh, microenvironment, expressing a different subset of the genes. So understanding what each cell is expressing is really critical to understand the biology. The second is the spatial information because these cells aren't just working in isolated droplets, they're very intricately uh, communicating with each other and the surrounding environment and responding in order to really uh, best sort of construct this full biological system. So more recently, in the last five to eight years, we've seen the widespread adoption of single cell sequencing technologies, which get you the single cell information, but then you still lose the spatial component. But now with spatial genomics, with Murfish uh, technology, you're able to perform this highly multiplex measurement to measure the number of transcripts that get you a good idea of what each cell is doing while maintaining the single cell context because of the very high spatial resolution and at the same time maintaining the spatial uh, component. So that's what VizGen is really excited about bringing to the market. But before I go into what the Mersco platform actually looks like, I'll, I'll, I'll first introduce the Murfish technology, this highly multiplex, high resolution spatial genomics technology. So Murfish is a technology that builds upon single molecule fish. In single molecule fish, you design fluorescently labeled probes that specifically bind to a target transcript so that when you look at this under a high resolution fluorescence microscope, each of the targeted RNA transcripts shows up as a diffraction limited spot in the microscope. So then by counting the number of spots, you can directly quantify the expression of the scene across the biological sample. So combined with cell segmentation, for example, you can see how this gene expression varies across different cells. But as with uh, traditional fluorescence technologies, single molecule fish is just limited to being able to measure a few genes at once, maybe three or, or sometimes five if you're using all, all the available colors. But there's tens of thousands of relevant transcripts within each uh, biological system. 
so MERFish is a technology that builds upon single, single molecule fish to greatly increase the multiplexing capacity. So just as a brief introduction, we'll hear more about MERFish and how it's used uh, later on. But MERFish is able to overcome this um, multiplexing gene throughput challenge by instead of reading genes out one at a time, we assign each of them a binary barcode. And then we read out that binary barcode using sequential rounds of single molecule fish. So as you see here, after we stain the sample, uh, we, we're able to stain the sample in such a way that first we're able to read out the first bit and the binary barcode as shown in the left hand side of this image. Here, all of the genes that were assigned a barcode that contained the one for the first position show up as the single molecule fish spot while all the genes that were assigned a barcode that contained the zero and the first position remain dark. So this reads out the first position and the barcode. Then we can extinguish the signal, restain for the next round, and the next round, and next round. And then by the pattern of brightness and darkness across this image stack, we're able to identify the gene at each spatial position across the sample. So this enables the very highly multiplexed spatial transcriptomic measurement. But from the way the technology works, there's just a couple advantages that I want to highlight briefly. First, it's an image-based technology. So in order to capture more cells, we just move the XY stage across larger tissue areas. So in a typical MERScope measurement, we can measure up to a square centimeter of tissue and capture hundreds of thousands of cells. With Invincin, we've demonstrated MERFish on a broad variety of different mouth and human tissues. MERFish builds upon single molecule fish, which in many cases is considered a gold standard for quantifying RNA abundance. And we maintain that very high sensitivity as we increase this multiplexing capacity. Next, MERFish is a single molecule measurement. So we have single molecule resolution across the whole tissue area that we image. So with this a single molecule resolution, we can really perform not just single cell level analysis, but also analysis on the intracellular organization of the transcriptome. And finally, with this binary encoding scheme, we have a custom multiplexing capacity where we can very easily tune the length of the barcode to target hundreds or thousands of different genes. Or as we'll hear about later, it's even efficient to, to use MERFish to very accurately quantify even smaller panels of genes on the order of tens of genes because this MERFish encoding scheme uh, provides a lot of error robustness to, to really guarantee that you're getting the right results out of the MERFish measurement. But as with any genomics technology, it has, should be both very highly quantitative and highly reproducible. So here for this mouse brain slice, with the MERFish measurement, we, we measured the full coronal slice and we can zoom into any region across this brain slice and really see exactly where each transcript is being expressed. So, uh, when we compare this to bulk sequencing, we find very good correlation between MERFish and bulk sequencing. And also when we compare replicate to replicate, we also find very good correlation, even in terms of absolute copy number uh, between replicate measurements. Okay, so to better explain what I mean by the high detection efficiency or high efficiency of a MERFish measurement, we can best do that in comparison with what's available on the spatial genomics market. So here we did a matched measurement between FizGen MERScope and this Oligo ray based platform. So when we compare the copy number detected with MERScope and the copy number detected in this matched sample with the Oligo ray based platform, we, we find that MERFish routinely detects 70 fold more transcripts. So since transcriptomics is already a relatively sparse signal, especially at the single cell level, for many transcripts, you only detect maybe 10 of some of these functionally relevant genes in a lot of cells. So for example, if we look at this opioid receptor delta-1 gene, when we plot out the expression with MERFish, we see this very rich spatial organization. While if we look at the expression with the oligo array base platform, we just see a few spots across the oligo grid where there's just maybe one or two copies of this transcript that were detected. So because of these advantages, we're really excited to start to enable more researchers to run MERFish measurements to advance their own research. So MERFish itself was originally published in 2015. Since then, there's been a number of publications, both from Zhao Zhuang's lab at Harvard, but also a number of, of other uh, research labs that have applied MERFish to a number of different biological questions. 
And there's also a growing number of institutions that are already using MRFISH. So you can see here, this doesn't even include some of the ones that BizGen is enabling, such as the Bro that you'll hear about uh, in the talk today. So that's MRFISH technology. But then we're, we also want to make MRFISH technology much more accessible. And we're doing that through MRScope, which is this platform solution for integrated spatial genomics. So MRScope is this instrument that performs the full MRFISH measurement. So within the box on the left, there's a microscope and a fluidic system to perform this iterative imaging, extinguishing and restaining in order to automate the full MRFISH process. So MRScope really combines the advantages of MRFISH chemistry with an automated, easy to use instrument and a whole reagent and software ecosystem. So with that, I, I'd like to turn it over to our two speakers for the, for the day, Emilia Favuzzi and Loic Binan, who have been working with us as early adopters of the MERSCOPE platform. I um, hope you're excited as I am to hear about the research that they've been doing with our, our early MERSCOPE instrument. Hello everyone, thank you for that introduction. Um, so I'm Emilia Favuzzi and uh, um, I'm really thankful for the opportunity to share our work today and uh, um, we'll jump right into it. So we know that brain circuits are extremely complex but also very specific. And so the overarching question we're interested in is how does this arise during development? For example, imagine you ask these two people to learn a new language who will learn it faster and uh, better. Well, likely the kid at the top. And uh, why? Because her brain is at this stage here uh, when neurons are forming synapses at very high speed. And then this is followed by a period of synapse pruning where the brain gets rid of all the extra connections. And as a result of that, the remaining wiring is more refined and more uh, efficient. And that's why when a connection is used repeatedly during development, it then becomes uh, permanent. And so synapse pruning is needed for precise brain wiring, but what does regulate pruning? Uh, well, several processes. But in the last years, work from many labs has shown that uh, microglia play a critical role in this process. And microglia are the brain immune cells, and they have this uh, really ramified morphology, and with their processes, they continuously survey their environment. And until relatively recently, it was thought microglia would just be there, become activated in response to tissue damage or infection, and essentially clean up toxins or dead uh, neurons. And that, that's, of course, still true. But now we know that microglia also play a number of non-inflammatory functions during normal uh, brain development, including the uh, regulation of uh, synapse pruning. But when we think about synapses, they're not really like this. They are more um, like this, uh, very heterogeneous. Uh, and that's true at both the molecular and at the functional uh, level. And, and the best example of this is the dichotomy between excitatory and um, inhibitory synapses. And so when we think about the role of microglia in synapse pruning, we really don't know whether they are genetic effectors of synapse pruning or if they can discriminate between uh, distinct types of uh, synapses. And so in this work, we explore the hypothesis that functional microglia diversity has evolved to ensure pruning of inhibitory versus excitatory uh, synapses. And we can really break this down in three specific uh, questions. First, do microglia regulate the development of the inhibitory circuits? And if that's the case, then what are the underlying cellular and molecular mechanisms? And third, what happens then at the behavioral level if we uh, disrupt their, their interaction? And so, like I said, at the beginning, we didn't even know whether microglia would actually regulate the development of the inhibitory circuits. And so we started using a relatively uh, blunt tool. We depleted microglia for the first two postnatal weeks in mice uh, using a pharmacological strategy. And as you can see here, this is very efficient. There's virtually no microglia left in the uh, cerebral cortex. And that's true from P4 throughout development until P15, when we then stop our depletion uh, protocol and ask what happened to the uh, cortical uh, circuits. And we focused on um, two types of inhibitory synapses, those made by somatostatin-positive interneurons that target uh, 
the dendrites of excitatory neurons, and parvalbumin positive synapses that exert a strong perisomatic uh, inhibition. Today, I'll focus more on uh, PV synapses. And then for comparison, we also looked at um, excitatory uh, synapses, and we did that in the mouse uh, somatosensory cortex. So, like I said, we started looking at uh, uh, PV synapses, and we found that they were increased in uh, microglia depleted mice. And this increase could only be detected uh, after the initial assembly of these uh, synapses, so after P12, suggesting a role for microglia in the uh, maturation or refinement of these synapses rather than really in their uh, formation. Then we asked whether the structural in increase in synapses was paralleled by a functional increase in PV inhibition. And so for that, we used optogenetics. We expressed channel rhodopsin in PV cells, stimulated them, and recorded from uh, excitatory neurons. Uh, and we found a higher response in uh, microglia depleted mice. So in my introduction, I mentioned how extraordinary brain development is. You know, circles are plastic, and learning is really facilitated. But brain development is also an exceptionally sensitive time window, when even subtle insults can cause alterations that will last throughout life. And so that's why we asked, so what happens if you let microglia repopulate uh, the brain after P15? Uh, uh, will uh, uh, the synapses catch up? And here you can see that at P30, uh, the, the depleted brains are essentially indistinguishable from uh, the control, so microglia do repopulate uh, the brain. Uh, but when we looked at the synapses, the hyperconnectivity defect was still there, suggesting that depleting microglia during development causes uh, long-lasting defects in um, inhibitory synapses. Then we also looked at uh, excitatory synapses for comparison, um, and here we're focusing on thalamic inputs. And consistent with previous work, we found that there were also increase in um, uh, the, uh, depleted mice, both structurally and functionally using uh, physiology. So if we go back to our first question, we, uh, we can now say that when you, if you deplete microglia during development, you'll have an increase in both excitatory and inhibitory synapses, suggesting that indeed microglia are important for the development of the inhibitory circuits. But then now we can ask, is this really due to a direct interaction of microglia with these uh, synapses? And so for that, we labeled PV synapses uh, in red um, using adeno-associated viruses that express Synaptophysin to the tomato under the control of a PV specific uh, enhancer. And we injected these virus in uh, uh, mice with uh, genetically labeled microglia. And what you can see here is that the processes of microglia are really wrapped around these uh, synapses, like in these examples. Uh, um, a subset of these synapses was also encapsulated within microglia and colocalized with uh, microglia lysosomes, suggestive of um, engulfment. But perhaps even more interestingly, we found that these contacts were developmentally regulated. So there was an increase between P12 and uh, P15, and the highest number at P15, P17, and then they decreased again uh, at P30. But of course, this is just a screenshot. Now we can ask how do these contacts last, or uh, how long, and how what happens when uh, synapse is contacted. And so to answer these questions, we um, used the same leveling tools that I just described and did uh, in vivo to photon imaging of microglia, PV synapse interactions uh, in layer four of the small sensory cortex. And we did that at the peak contact uh, period, P1517. And what you can see here is a microglia that over a period of 30 minutes really contacts the, the majority of the PV synapses around. So first on the left and at the bottom and so on, uh, top. And when we do this for several cells and several animals, we can really get an idea of what happens uh, on average. And the first thing that we noticed was a bimodal behavior of uh, microglia. So there was a first group of cells that almost avoided PV synapses or contacted very few of them. Uh, and then a second group of cells that contacted the majority of uh, PV synapses, around up to 60, 70 percent of them. And we also found that um, within the populations that the population that contacted less PV synapses, the interactions that did occur had a significantly shorter duration as compared to the interactions within uh, the population that was um, more actively engaged with uh, PV synapses. So then we asked, so what signal?
these different uh, interactions. And so for that, we um, mined, published transcriptional data to identify ligand receptor pairs that were selectively expressed in inhibitory neurons, but not excitatory neurons, and microglia during development. And among the, the, the top candidates, there was this GABA-GABA B receptor uh, pair. And actually, this is a strong uh, precedent. Uh, uh, in addition to its role as a neurotransmitter, GABA acts as a paracrine signal to regulate several developmental processes, like progenitor proliferation, neuronal migration, synapse formation. And most of these functions are actually mediated through GABA-B uh, receptors. On, on the other side, uh, previous work in the adult had shown that a subset of microglia express uh, GABA-B receptors, and they actually respond to GABA, for instance, by uh, changing their uh, motility. And so the first thing that we did was to confirm that at P15 in the somosensory cortex, uh, um, around 20 to 30 percent of microglia express both GABA-B receptor uh, subunits. And we also found that the PV synapses were preferentially contacted by these GABA receptive uh, microglia, whereas the opposite was true for excitatory synapses. They were preferentially contacted by microglia that did not express uh, GABA B receptors. So then we uh, removed GABA B receptors from microglia using two distinct CRE driver lines, and uh, uh, what we found was that the knockout uh, microglia contacted significantly fewer PV uh, synapses. But when we uh, looked at the excitatory ones, we found that the proportion of excitatory synapses contacted by uh, GABA-B knockout microglia uh, was unchanged. So then we went back to our in vivo two photon imaging experiments and repeated these experiments in the knockout. And, and this is the control that I show you with the bimodal distribution that I showed you earlier. And when we repeated it in the knockout, we found that the, these interactions were no longer bimodal and actually more closely uh, resemble those that interact less. Uh, with uh, PB synapses. So we thought, well, it really looks like this um, uh, GABA receptive microglia might be dedicated to remodel uh, inhibitory synapses. But then if that's the case, then these knockout mice should have connectivity defects that are somehow similar to what we found when we completely uh, depleted uh, microglia, right? And, and what we found was quite remarkable. So again, we, we looked at PV synapses in GABA-B knockout mice, and uh, we found that they were increased uh, in the knockout, both structurally and functionally uh, using physiology. So what this means is that removing GABA-B receptors from microglia phenocopies that effect on um, inhibitory synapses that we had seen when we had completely depleted uh, microglia. But then we looked at excitatory uh, synapses, and here we found no effect. And so what this means is that removing GABA-B receptors from microglia also decouples that effect on inhibitory versus excitatory synapses that we had seen in the uh, microglia depleted mice. And so then we went on and looked for uh, the molecular mechanisms downstream of GABA-B receptors in uh, microglia. And for that, we isolated microglia from the somosensory cortex of uh, PCT, control, and GABA-B knockout mice, and we did uh, single-cell RNA sequencing. And the first thing that we did was to integrate control and uh, knockout uh, mice, and, uh, knockout cells, and you can see here that they align pretty well. These cells segregate in eight uh, mixed clusters, and of course, I won't have time to describe these clusters in the details, but an important message here is that uh, removing GABA-B receptors from microglia doesn't fundamentally alter the range of uh, microglial states that can be uh, observed in the knockout. And so then within each of these clusters, we compared control and uh, knockout cells, uh, and, and we found that the cluster where they were more different was this cluster 4 here. Now, cluster 4 contains microglia uh, expressing higher levels of what is known as homeostatic microglia core genes uh, and higher levels of pruning genes. And so they're more mature microglia that are more likely to um, carry out pruning functions. And so then we looked at the identity of these differentially expressed uh, genes, and we found that they were broadly involved in pruning. And when I say broadly involved in pruning, what I mean is that they really involve classical pruning genes, but also genes involved in uh, motility, migration, cell cell adhesion, uh, and phagocytosis. And so it's really not one or two genes that are altered. It's a whole program that is, uh, that is different in this, in this knockout cells. But then when we looked at the down-regulated genes with uh, single cell resolution, we found that they were altered 
only in a, in a subset of my, this microgliaridin cluster for around 25% uh, of them. And these same cells uh, segregate as a transcriptionally uh, distinct cluster within uh, cluster four. And so the question now is, are these uh, cells GABA recessive microglia. And unfortunately, we really couldn't answer this question with um, single cell or single cell data because uh, GABA B receptors are um, expressed at low levels in uh, microglia. And uh, this is, and so we could really couldn't, um, we had an incomplete detection of GABA receptive microglia, and this is known as uh, dropout events. And so that's why we started a wonderful collaboration with like uh, it's gonna speak now, and uh, Sammy Fire at the Broad Institute, where we did more fish profiling of control and knockout microglia again at P15 in the somal sensory cortex to answer uh, this question. Now, like is gonna give you a, a broader overview, uh, and then we'll come back uh, showing you uh, what we found about that. Thank you, Emilia. So, um, once you've decided that you want to use Murfish for your experiment, um, what are the first steps you need to take? Uh, first, you need to um, put together a list of genes that you are going to measure in your sample, uh, which I'm showing you here. And then, uh, because that list has a lot of genes, we don't want to uh, image each of these genes separately, and um, we're going to multiplex the experiment. That means that we associate to that list of genes a code book, such as the one that I'm showing here, which tells you that any transcript for GABA1 is going to be fluorescent in the image uh, 1, 2, 6, and 10 of the sample. So what that actually means uh, when you do the data acquisition, uh, on the scope, we have five color channels. One is used for uh, imaging the nuclei, DAPI. One is used in green to image uh, fiducial bits that we use to realign the images during round. So that leaves us with three useful uh, channels for the data. And so um, if we look back at that code book, we can see that in imaging round one, the images one and two will show spots for GABA one. And those spots will also be fluorescent in the third image of image round two, not at all in image round three, and again uh, in the image of image round four. And similar thing for all of those genes in that list. So, um, on top of that, we also added a couple of genes that we measured with an SM fish design. So, just one color, one channel at a time for those genes. The reason we did that is that those genes are either expressed as very low levels, such as GABA2, and we wanted to really make sure that we would be able to pick them up, or some of those were very short and we weren't able to fit enough probes on them to do murfish. I'm going to explain that in more detail later. So once you've decided that you want any transcripts for GABA1 to be fluorescent in uh, these images, uh, what's the next step? Uh, this gen will um, design and sell custom libraries of probes that are um, going to do that. The way that works is that we have a, a library of encoding probes that have this U shape, such as uh, shown here, that are going to tile the RNA of the transcript we want to see. Usually we have at least 20 of these encoding probes per RNA, which allows uh, for our signal amplification. Um, okay, at this point we still have nothing that is very recent, and the next step is during the acquisition, we are going to be flowing in um, the readout probes, which are actually the fluorescent uh, probes, and these will anneal on those arms that are on each side of the encoding probe. So we will first flow three of these to uh, acquire the three colors of image round one, then flow in a, a cleavage buffer that's going to remove just the fluor four here, so that we can then flow in the next three uh, fluorescent probes and repeat until we've acquired the whole code book. So doing this uh, generates images such as this one, where you can see that we have a lot of uh, isolated spots. Each of these corresponds to one of the transcripts that are supposed to be fluorescent in round one, which is the first column on the left. So it can be either of those genes. And the way to know which one they are is to also look at the image for round two. And any spot that is going to be fluorescent in both of those images is either a gene for uh, transcript of 
Jabber 1, RP2, RYL12, or CISPAN uh, 3. Uh, and when you go through all 10 images, that's how you can decode this multiplex experiment and know which of these spots correspond to a transcript of each of those genes. And to decode this, we use a software also provided by this gene that is called Merlin. And that's um, what allowed me to generate images such as the one that is here, where uh, it's a binary image and I'm only putting a pixel on if uh, Merlin decoded that at this precise location, there was a transcript for gene uh, TMN119 here. Um, a couple more details on that. We use a code book that is Hemingway 400 distance 4. What that means is that any gene will be fluorescent in four different channels. That's the Hemingway 4. Um, and Hamming distance 4 means that for inside that code book, any two genes will have at least four bits that will be different. And doing that allows to correct errors either in the, in the chemistry where some probe just didn't anneal and made uh, a bit appear negative when it should be positive, for instance, or during decoding. How do we do that? For instance, if uh, we see a spot that has the sequence shown here, uh, this spot is present or appears present in five different channels, but this thing only has one difference with the sequence we know represents the other one. So we are going to say that this spot is actually a transcript for GABA1. And um, because it is then different from at least three uh, differences from any other gene in the code book. That also works for one to zero errors. If we have a transcript that shows in these three uh, different images here, this one is also only one bit different from the sequence for GABA1. So we can say that it is a transcript for GABA1. It's also different from at least three from any other of those genes. Okay, so once we have decoded the transcript, we still need to segment the cells and count each of the genes within each of those cells. And here, um, I chose to use what we know of the biology of our sample. We know we are only interested in microglia, which means that the cells we're segmenting are isolated in that brain and that they express very specific genes. So to segment those cells, we use uh, the decoded images for transcripts of the genes TMEM119 and FTRLs that are specific to these microglia. And I diluted, dilated those uh, spots to make them bigger, which in also makes dense areas uh, merge together into a bigger object. And then I was able to remove small objects from this image. So any isolated uh, spot here was removed and only the dense areas stayed and gave us the shape of those cells. And once that was done, I only had to count the transcript for every gene in the library that we were measuring inside those uh, cells. There is one other uh, technical detail. It's uh, we also need to segment the cells in Z. That is very important here because we are interested in the level of expression of GABA receptors in the microglia. And most likely the cells that are neighboring those microglia are neurons which express high levels of these receptors. So what you're looking at here are the counts for two cells, uh, two microglia. And uh, we're looking at the counts in each of the Z's that this, micro, this cell is found in. So on the left, you can see that we have very low uh, counts for microglia specific genes in the Z0 to 4 or to 3. And in Z4, 5, and 6, we see a much higher count of uh, microglia specific genes. So from that, we concluded that the microglia is actually in those layers. And when we look at GABA spots, you see that they are also within those layers. So cell 1 here is actually a GABA receptor expressing microglia. Whereas if we look at cell number 2 here on the right, we see that the cell has, uh, is present in layers 0, 1, and 2, where we have high uh, numbers of spots for microglia specific genes. But if we look at GABA spots, we see that we don't see anything in layers 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, 4 but there are higher levels of 
GABA receptor transcripts in the last layer. And that most likely indicates that this last layer is actually part of a neural, and we don't want to segment this, but in that layer with the microglia. To do that, we decided to use a threshold on the number of spots for microglia specific genes, which means that I only counted the transcripts for all of those genes in each of the Z's if we found more than five microglia specific genes in the Z we are looking at. Um, finally, I mentioned that we also included SMFish uh, genes in there. Uh, how do, do we analyze those? These proved to be much more difficult. Uh, we had two options, either count spots for those uh, transcripts or integrate the signal, the sun on the surface of the cell. So first we tried this, and the output of this analysis actually did not match what we knew of the biology of those genes. So we restarted and counted the spots in cells instead. So as you can see on this example image here, even with the SMFish uh, probe design, we can still see a lot of spots that we can actually count in those cells. And that actually matched much better the, the biology of we know of the sample. But in those genes that we were measuring with SMFish, we also had uh, mitochondrial genes. And obviously those are very clustered in a very small space, and it's not possible here to count isolated uh, transcripts. So we just uh, abandoned those genes and didn't analyze further. And now, Emilia is going to tell you how she made sense of all of this uh, data. Right, yes. So the next thing we did was to uh, cluster uh, these microglia from the uh, Murphy's profiling. And actually the clusters were not too different from what we had found with the single cell RNA sequence. And in particular, if you focus on this cluster four and cluster four GG here, um, you might recognize this uh, gene that I showed you earlier with the single cell RNA sequence. So again, cluster four and four GG were, were microglia that were expressing higher levels of homeostatic microglia core genes and also higher levels of pruning genes. For example, this is uh, a well-known uh, gene involved in pruning, and you can see that the expression is higher in both cluster 4 and 4GG. But an important difference is that what does GG mean? Uh, they were uh, microglia expressing uh, GABA B receptors. And this was important because besides the expression of GABA B receptor, we could also identify additional genes that represented a signature of these microglia actually across different clusters. It's like these, these cell addition molecules uh, of the tetrapanin family that were uh, particularly enriched in uh, GABA receptor microglia. We also had spatial information, so we could see that GABA receptive microglia were anatomically interspersed with uh, microglia that did not express GABA B receptors. And we also found that uh, these GABA receptive microglia are really uniformly distributed across uh, cortical layers in the cerebral cortex. And, but then we could finally go back to our initial question uh, about downregulated genes. And sure enough, the same genes that we had seen were downregulated with single cell RNA seq, were also downregulated in the knockout uh, microglia. Again, um, pruning genes or genes involved in chemotaxis or uh, phagocytosis. But now we had an additional information. And what we found was that these genes were selectively downregulated in cluster 4 GG, so in GABA receptive microglia from cluster 4, and not in uh, uh, cluster 4 uh, GABA B negative cells, and not in other uh, GABA receptive microglia. And so what this really shows is that the transcriptional changes that we had observed in GABA B knockout mice indeed are uh, restricted to uh, GABA receptive microglia, so are cell autonomous. And, and then the, the really the last question that we had uh, was what happens uh, if you disrupt the interaction between microglia and inhibitory synapses at the behavioral level. And uh, um, to answer this question, we used MoSeq or motion sequencing that was developed by the data lab at uh, Harper Medical School. And, and MoSeq really uh, allows unsupervised analysis of mouse behavior and is based on the idea that behavior is composed of specific um, uh, motifs called uh, syllables in music, like a specific type of run or, or, or a rear, and they all come together following a specific structure to produce continuous behavior. 
And so when we looked at the usage of syllables in uh, controlling GABA B knockout mice, we found that the knockouts downregulate syllables um, associated with different types of running or grooming and downregulate syllables associated with uh, pausing uh, behavior. We also found that uh, GABA B knockout mice had an increased locomotor activity suggesting uh, overall hyperactivity and finally when we looked at these state maps where the nodes are the different syllables and the edges are the transitions between them we found that the uh, knockout mice down regulate the majority of the transitions between syllables and so essentially they mainly oscillate within this repetitive running and and, and grooming uh, so again further uh, confirming the hyperactivity and repetitive uh, behavior and so to summarize what we show you, um, we have seen that uh, during development, GABA binds to GABA B receptors on GABA receptive uh, microglia. And they, they activate a tenacity remodeling program increasing motility, also vision, and uh, phagocytosis. And as a result of that, these cells contact more and more inhibitory synapses over development. And, and that's why if you remove all microglia, like in the depletion, uh, you'll have an increase in both excitatory and inhibitory uh, synapses. But if you only remove GABA B receptors from microglia, you will selectively increase uh, inhibitory synapses. And we've also seen that these defects will uh, persist throughout the life of the animal uh, and will ultimately impact uh, behavior. And so finally, I wanted to uh, thank, of course, a lot of people who worked on this project. Uh, first, uh, Gore Fischel and a lot of uh, uh, collaborators in the Fischel lab. Uh, also, our external collaborators, Beth Stevens, and uh, more recently, like Karen and Sammy, who were paid collaborators for the Murfish experiments. Uh, Bob Data and his postdoc Ayman for the MoSeq behavioral experiments. And in general, all the time, people who shared uh, mice and um, reagents uh, with us. And thank you, and um, we're happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Savuzzi, <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Savuzzi and Dr. Benon for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, how many Z planes do you collect? And what is the thickness of the tissue used? Hey, thank you for the question. Um, we collect seven Z planes. Uh, the tissue is 10 micron thick. And so we collect the planes starting from the level of the glass, and those planes are spaced by 1.5 micrometer. When occasionally a spot shows the same identity in two consecutive Z planes, uh, those spots are filtered uh, during analysis to count the transcript only one. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Benon. Now, moving on to our next question. How many genes did you probe with? Uh, did you probe for with the murfish? Should I go? I can go. Uh, we probed twenty-three genes, um, just because we had a specific list from the uh, single cell RNA seq, but we could have definitely added more. Thank you, Dr. Fususi, for that answer. Now, our next question, um, let's go to, okay, here's one for you. Uh, this audience member says, great presentation. Could you please explain how to analyze uh, the GABA RB2 isoforms? And I realized we have four different um, isoforms of GABA RB2. And maybe I can start, I don't know if George wants to add something. I mean, that is a good question. We didn't, but we didn't differentiate uh, among the different isoforms, uh, and our GABA B probes were indeed designed for a region that is common uh, to all isoforms. So perhaps George maybe can comment on the strategies that can be implemented to design isoform-specific probes. Uh, 
Yeah, so I can elaborate a little bit on the capacity of uh, MERFISH to detect isoforms. So, so currently, if there's enough uh, sequence difference between the two splice variants that you want to uh, detect, then we can design MERFISH probes uh, specifically targeting that, that different sequence. If the difference in sequence is very small, then it becomes more challenging for us to identify isoforms. But if that is something that we're working to improve so that we can even identify splice variants with very small sequence differences. Thank you both for that answer. And our next question. <clears throat> in the brain tissue, it is hard to separate the neurons and astrocytes because these cells have long axon and dendrite. So you mentioned that you can use this technique for single cell analysis. How could you recognize the single cell from those complicated cells? In the case of microglia, I was able to segment more or less the shape of the cell using the transcript, as I explained. But in general, when we look at all those cell types that together in the same sample, we're segmenting the cell body, and we're actually not looking at what, what is happening in the axons or dendrites. Thank you, Dr. Benon, for that answer. Um, our next question. Can you explain the sample preparation set for MERFISH? Um, yes. So, um, well, the first step is to slice tissue and put it on the cover slip. By the way, this is also doable with uh, cells from a cell line that you can just plate on the cover slip. Then, uh, essentially, it's a very basic uh, cell fixation, cell permeabilization, and then you incubate for, with a library of encoding probes. So those are the uh, non fluorescent probes that uh, I'm showing here on this schematic. Uh, and then uh, to improve the noise to signal ratio, uh, signal to noise ratio, we clear the tissue. So one thing that I'm not showing here is that on top of those probes, there is a poly T capture probe that will crosslink the RNA to a hydrogel in which we're embedding the tissue which then allows us to remove proteins and lipids to make the images cleaner. And once all that is done, the cover slip is uh, inserted in a microfluidic chamber, and the fluorescent probes are fl uh, flowed in one, uh, three at a time. And then uh, during the imaging, once three probes are from one imaging round are imaged, we cleave and remove the fluorophore that is showed here. that answers the question. Great, thank you so much. Our next question, did you see any effect at specific inhibitory synapses after deleting GABA B receptors from the microglia? Yeah, and uh, I'm seeing the rest of the question about SST synapses. I think that that is a, an excellent question. We did look at different subtypes and the, the, the whole scenario is particularly interesting because the effect is not specific for PV synapses. We do see a similar effect on SST synapses as well. But um, for instance, uh, the, the question ends with uh, the layer specificity. Indeed, we do see this effect in layer four. It looks like in upper layers, layer two, three uh, is less clear. So there seems to be some layer specificity. And to end the part about the subtypes, for example, BIT synapses um, do not seem to be affected. So there's heterogeneity for sure in the way the, the different uh, inhibitory synapses are affected by uh, microglia. Thank you, Dr. Pavuzzi. Uh, we still have time for a couple more questions, but I do want to remind our audience, any questions that we are unable to get to today will be answered by our speakers via the email address that you provided at the time of registration. Our next question, is microglia pruning of PV inputs specific to pyramidal cell targets or also seen at PV inputs onto other inhibitory cells? That is another very good question. Um, it is specific for the input onto pyramidal cells. We didn't see any effect on PV, PV synapses, which is particularly interesting because it suggests that there is also something at the level of this synapses that is a threat in microglia. So something that we definitely want to follow up in the future. Yeah, great question. <laughs> 
Thank you for that. And it looks like we've got time for a couple more questions. So how many rounds of reporter readout probe cycles do you do for Murfish? One of, one of the most standard um, setups in terms of the, the simplest code book we can use has uh, 18 bits, which we image in six imaging rounds with three bits per round. That allows us to target 140 barcodes, which we use to identify 130 genes and 10 blanks that are used for quality checks. So, um, yes, 18 bits, so that, that is 18 different fluorescent probes. Thank you so much, Dr. Benon. Our next question, is GABA-B receptor expression in microglia transient only during the development? Um, so this is complex because the B receptors in microglia have two different functions. It was shown previously by the Kettenman lab that uh, GABA-B receptor is also important for the uh, anti-inflammatory role of GABA. And so the expression itself is not transient because in the adult you also have this additional function also during development. So we also see some uh, uh, evidence of that in our um, sequencing uh, data. And so uh, definitely, uh, there's changes uh, during development in terms of increasing expression that happens at early postnatal stages, and then it goes up, uh, but then it stays on uh, probably because of this additional function. Thank you so much. And it looks like we've got time for one more question, so let's find our next question here. How long does the gene have to be successful for the Murfish probe design? Uh, so maybe I can elaborate a little bit on the Murfish probe design. So for Murfish, just to make sure that we maintain this very high detection efficiency that we see with single molecule fish, we, we do try to tie on multiple probes to each transcript so that in case one of the probes doesn't bind, we still have a large fraction of the remaining probes and we get a bright enough signal from that transcript. So we typically aim for at least 30 uh, target regions so and then that with the length considering the length of the target regions that that brings the minimum length of a gene to around uh 700 to a thousand nucleotides so we are able to design probes for shorter genes but it's just at the risk of having a, a lower detection efficiency for that gene thank you george for that answer and so glad that you could join us for the q a as well we want to thank all of our speakers today Dr. Benan, Dr. Fafuzi, and George Emanuel from BizGen for their important research. We would also like to thank the audience for joining us today and they're submitting all of their amazing questions. Any questions, again, that we didn't have time for will be answered by our speakers via the contact information that you provided at the time of registration. This webinar will be on demand. Labyrinths will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye, everyone.